around for them for a long time, and I also want um, all of them to live uh, full and healthy lives. Um, according to the American Heart Association, heart disease and stroke account for over 600,000 deaths in the United States every year. In 2016, they reported some of the leading heart-related conditions, as shown here, were attributed to cause of death. Fortunately, nearly 80% of those deaths are preventable. American Heart Month represents a perfect opportunity to learn more about building longer lives and healthier hearts, which is why all of you are here tonight. So tonight's the night we put our health first. So let's start by welcoming our special guests tonight. We will hear from patients who are heart survivors. And please give a wave over there uh, so our audience knows who is who. Keith Glassoff and Wayne Hallberg of Eau Claire. We can't thank you enough for being here tonight. And we are joined by health experts from Mayo Clinic Health System, cardiovascular surgery physician assistants, Sean Marzak and Gloria Kruger, and cardiologist, Dr. Andrew Kelvin. And we're gonna make this pretty informal. We'll ask our cardiac center experts to talk about heart health and warning signs, and we'll hear from Wayne and Keith and learn about their heart care by our panel, and then um, wrap up at the end with some questions and answers. So Gloria, can you share why risk factors may be different between men and women? So risk factors for people are high cholesterol, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, and genetics. Um, the metabolic syndrome, which uh, basically is a combination of fat around your stomach area, high blood pressure, high blood sugars, and also high triglycerides, which is part of the cholesterol panel. Another thing that a lot of people don't think about is women. Um, is mental stress and depression, and also uh, estrogen. Low levels of estrogen can also cause um, small vessel heart disease. Okay, and uh, Dr. Kelvin, uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, blood pressure guidelines. So blood pressure guidelines over the past few years has been one of the most controversial areas uh, within all of cardiology. Over the past few years, we've attained uh, even more very robust data that pushing blood pressures to lower levels, nearly normal levels, seems to prevent heart attacks and strokes. The science is very clear. High blood pressure is a leading cause of heart attacks and strokes, heart failure, and kidney failure. So it's critically important that folks have their blood pressure checked periodically and that they work with their primary physician to get their blood pressure under very reasonable control. We've got a plethora of tools and resources and medications available to us, and we can almost always find a regimen for a particular person that works well with them. As far as specific goals, uh, again, that's a little controversial right now, but I think most docs here at Mayo follow some pretty basic principles to get people under reasonable control, and doing so dramatically reduces their risk of, of living a shortened life. Okay, and Dr. Kelvin, can you also tell us about heart attack symptoms? Sure. So a heart attack is caused by a blockage in a heart artery, often one that breaks open suddenly and leads to a complete or near complete occlusion of the blood vessel. The classic symptoms are chest discomfort, particularly in the center, sometimes left side of the chest, often radiating to one or both shoulders. There can be uh, less typical symptoms that go along with it, such as pain radiating up into the neck or back. There can be indigestion, nausea, sweating, um, a whole host of symptoms. And everyone is a little bit different. And so the important thing is that if you think you might be having a heart attack, don't call me, call 911. Because our ambulance services in the Chippewa Valley um, can actually activate our cath lab to get definitive treatment so that you go straight from the ambulance into the cath lab. They have medications available to begin early treatment of a heart attack, and they have a defibrillator to restart the heart should the heart stops. Unless, uh, if you think a spouse is gonna drive you in uh, to treat your heart attack, if your spouse has a defibrillator in the car, that's great, but you should really wonder what your spouse is doing with a defibrillator. <laughs> so the point is, heart attack symptoms can vary incredibly person to person. And if you think you may be having a heart attack, please call 911. Worst case scenario is you're wrong, you're embarrassed, you go into the emergency department, they tell you that it's just indigestion. 
I did this to my own mother once, but I'm glad I did. And fortunately, she's okay. Thank you. All of our patients tonight listened to what their hearts were telling them and sought help before it was too late. But I will let them share in a little more detail. So Wayne, let's hear from you first. Um, my situation was not typical in that I did not have an event. Uh, no 911, no uh, helicopter ambulance rides. Um, I had a regularly scheduled appointment with my uh, physician uh, for an exam. And uh, he said, gee, that heart murmur sounds funny. Let's get it checked out. And sure enough, the next day I went in, had an echo, and I knew something was up when the second person walked in. And then the third person eventually arrived to tell me that, yes, you do have a bad valve. You uh, also have uh, an ascending aorta, which is uh, about maxed out. And then you also uh, probably have blockages in arteries. Well, it's kind of like falling downstairs. All, all were true. And uh, that was on the 6th of December, and testing and waiting. Uh, eventually had surgery, seven and a half hours worth, on uh, the 18th of December, and then a, a recovery, and things are going well. But um, I think part of the success has been I was very active physically. Um, the only symptoms I had, I probably ignored, um, almost 70, and I thought, well, it's okay to get short of breath if you're splitting wood with a maul. Uh, so I was working hard, doing a lot of physical labor, and um, thought, not much of it. And this uh, doctor who uh, actually saved my life, because uh, that got the attention. And the uh, care I received at Luther Hospital at Mayo was wonderful and extraordinary. It's um, why I'm here. All right, thank you, Wayne and for sharing that. And Dr. Kelvin, can you explain in more detail how the heart functioned in Wayne's case and uh, when an intervention may be needed? Sure, so the basic uh, function of the heart is to pump blood to meet the demands of the body. Uh, there are four main valves in the heart, all of which need to work properly to open and let blood out and to close properly to keep blood from flowing backwards. Uh, to feed all this machinery, there are arteries, these coronary arteries, that bring blood flow to the heart. Uh, there are three main coronary arteries that we spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, there's a number of smaller arteries as well, and if those get blocked off, they can cause problems. And then finally, uh, in Wayne's case, there's, a, uh, there's an aorta that in some people gets too large over time, and if that aorta gets too large, it, it can be at risk of breaking open. And if it breaks open, that usually is, uh, that kills the person quite rapidly. So that's kind of the basics of the structure of the heart. All right, Keith, it's your turn. Thank you, Judy. Well, my name is Keith Glasshoff, and I do have heart disease. I sort of say that like the guy that checks in at uh, Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> in their meetings. But in any instance, the, uh, over the period of time, uh, I had began to lose some of my strength. I noticed that I wasn't as ambitious, ambitious as I should have been. And I should have been alert for some kind of heart issue. I wasn't. On October 15th, I was in this building, up on the third floor, in the, uh, what they call the rehab lab. It's really kind of like a a health club where there are all kinds of exercises, machines, and, and you do what you do to stay in shape. The morning, it was 7 o'clock in the morning, was a nice day. I got on a treadmill and I'm slowly building up to speed. My friend was on the treadmill next to me. He was doing likewise. We're carrying on a conversation. And all of a sudden, I thought something had gone wrong with the treadmill. It didn't feel right. I looked, I could see the treadmill, I focused on the control panel on the top of the treadmill, and my vision went white. It looked like the screen of a television when the station you're tuned to is off the air, nothing but a flicker of light. And that lasted maybe a second, and then nothing. 
pure darkness and no sense of anything. My wife and I were talking after I got back and she kind of kidded me about things and, and uh, she said to me, so did you see anybody you know? I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, when you saw the white light. <laughs> I told her I saw a black light at last, and I think maybe I made a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> what it turns out is I had something called cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest occurs when your heart stops pumping blood. It may be sitting there doing something, but it's not pumping. You lose consciousness and you stop breathing. Now, how many of you are swimmers? Raise your hand. Have gone swimming at least once in your life? <laughs> That's what I thought, just about everybody. There's a lot of similarities. When you swim, the idea is to have fun, do good things, but to keep your head above water frequently enough to catch some fresh air. When you have cardiac arrest, you're unconscious. You have no ability to do anything. You are there, and what is, is. I happen to have been fortunate in a matter of less than three seconds from when I first felt something wasn't right. The nurses at, at the rehab center sounded a code blue. They knew. They saw all the symptoms. They knew. I think everybody knew, except me. I didn't know. So I, I fell down on the treadmill, was tangled up in it. In a matter of less than 15 seconds, the nurses had me all stretched out prone on the floor. One was doing deep chest uh, compressions. The other was handling a little uh, respirator, which was forcing fresh air into my lungs. And the third one was getting a defibrillator ready to fire. Shortly after that, the emergency medical team burst into the room. Right behind them was Dr. Dan Kincaid. Uh, they took up the positions of doing the compressions, doing the respirator, and, and in general, uh, getting ready to use a defibrillator. It was about two and a half minutes or so now into my experience. I'm unconscious. I have no idea what's going on around me. Uh, the gentleman that was doing, a, doing the deep compressions truly understand, understood his job. And he was exercising his privilege at, at, the, at, the, at the optimum level. The optimum level is to move your sternum about two inches, I'm told. I have no medical knowledge of that. But the gold standard for good uh, chest compressions is that you break something. I learned from reading the radiologist's reports after the fact, they did a really good job. <laughs> I've never known a radiologist to use the term numerous. That he did in describing the number of fractures and broken ribs I had from the deep concussions. Don't get me wrong. I'm as, as grateful as I could possibly be for that to have happened because as it continued to work on me and fired one time the defibrillator, things started to work. I don't know how the process goes. I assume first blood starts pump or the heart stops pumping and, and blood flows. And, and I think since secondly you start realizing a little consciousness. And then thirdly, I think you uh, begin to feel uh, the ability to recognize things around you, some sense of weakness. Uh, I remember hearing a voice and I, I said out loud, hey Dan, is that you? And, and I do remember saying that and, and I've checked with the nurses and I did say it for fact. But somehow I recognized that Dan was in the room. Somehow I recognized that he was on the floor, hands and knees, between my knees, looking for a sign of pulse, a sign of breathing, a sign of some sense of consciousness. 
and all of them felt, I'm sure, a great sense of relief when I started to breathe. I mentioned swimming. In swimming, we have a sense about us as to just how long we can stay underwater. And if we don't have a sense, our natural reactions tell us it's time to take a breath. When you're in cardiac arrest, you don't have that. But you equally begin to deteriorate if you stay too long in uh, cardiac arrest, as you would if you were caught underwater and could not get back up to the surface. The only difference between the two, well, no, the major difference between the two is that when you're swimming, you're conscious and you can do something about it. When, cardiac, when you're in cardiac arrest, you are unconscious and can't do anything about it. Once they realized I had begun to function on my own, they moved me up onto a gurney and I allowed a pretty big squeal. I remember specifically doing so. It wasn't my heart. It was the ribs that were poking me. And I brought a smile, though I think everybody in the room, when I, when I let out that squeal, because I knew things had worked. They took me down to um, critical care, lined me up to get into the cath lab, went in and, and uh, looked through an angiogram as to what went wrong. Why did this happen? They knew what had happened. They knew how to fix it. But now they needed to know how to keep it from happening again. As they went in, they went through the major artery connecting to your heart, and they found a lesion, a fairly substantial lesion. Over the top of that lesion was what I call a scab. You guys got better terms for it, I'm sure. But it had blocked off 80% of the flow of blood to my heart. So I was operating on 20% of capacity. I didn't realize it. I did remember one thing. I continued on the uh, therapy in the lab, the rehab lab. And I noticed I had plateaued in trying to improve my performance on the treadmill. The reason I'm interested in the treadmill is because the FAA, which controls flying, and I'm a pilot, uh, what, what I've learned is you have to be able to handle phase three of a echo stress test. And that, that was the, the issue at hand. So I'm in the cath lab, or in the yeah, cath lab, they found this, this lesion, and they put in a stent. I, do you expand them, or just wedge them in, or how does that work? I don't know. Anyway, they put in this, this uh, stent. It fully encased the, the uh, protrusion into my vessel and did a test, and they had completely restored my blood flow to 100%. I just yesterday finished the uh, phase two of the recovery process. You go through the rehab process to build yourself back. Uh, that all went well. I'm progressing in terms of my abilities, my energy level, everything is, is going in the right direction. And so things are good. While I went through this process, I recognized that I had not really done what I should have done to assure myself the longest and healthiest life possible. I did not uh, accomplish a lot of things. My eating habits were not what they should have been. I did not exercise as regularly as I should have, and I did not get the kind of rest I should have been getting. And those three things, from my perspective, are the key to future good health. I came up with something I call lessons learned. These are the things that struck me I wish I would have known in advance, or I wish I would have had the insight 
to recognize these things, but had to learn them by the hard knocks of, of uh, event, an event. Acknowledge your, genera your uh, genetics. My mother and my father both died of heart disease. I happen to have very good blood, very low blood pressure, 120 over 70 something, consistently. So I thought, haha, I, I snuck by. At a cholesterol, 140, the standard was 200. Now I think that's changed these days. But I thought, haha, I snuck by. But low, slowly and definitely, the deposits occurred and the restrictions occurred, and they had to do a series of stints back not four months ago, but more like 10 months ago. So here they are. Acknowledge your genetics. Listen to your body. Gretchen and I were in Milwaukee uh, on a cold spring day. Uh, overnight, we'd, there was about a, a snowstorm that moved through. It was a fast-moving cold front, dropped 8, 10 inches of snow. And I got up, shoveled the driveway, and said to Gretchen, I'm going to go for a walk. I came back from that walk, and I felt this fuzziness across the top of my chest. No pain. Truth is, I've never had pain one since I had a heart problem. But a fuzziness, and I <laughs> made the mistake of telling Gretchen, hey, I feel something fuzzy. She was not happy until I called Dr. Casper and said, hey, doctor, I need to, need to talk to you about something. They did a echo stress gram, a stress uh, test. I had a problem. It, my flow to the, my heart was uh, severely restricted. Don't be deceived. I was deceived. I thought the absence of pain, the ab absence of discomfort, the absence of something would have indicated to me that I don't have a problem. Nonsense. I did. It just wasn't telling me loud enough, and I wasn't listening carefully enough. Recognize there may be setbacks. When someone breaks a leg, they can put your leg together, put some screws in it, stiffen it up, put it in a plate if necessary, and things work. With the heart, it's more like peeling an onion. That unit is there and you peel off the first set of circumstances you encountered, lo and behold, there's another layer right below it. It may be uh, circuitry problems, it may be any one of a, a number of physical problems, but you just keep peeling down and peeling down and keep count encountering things. Finally, uh, the last one I want to mention is be positive. I have so many friends who have been through some kind of heart experience, and many of them have just a bad attitude. And I keep asking myself, why is that? Well, I don't have those answers, but I know this. I'm not going to let it happen to me. I'm going to be upbeat, forward, and, and stay on the positive side of things. And I think that's helped me over the past year to come a long way from where I was a few months ago. I have to tell you that I couldn't be prouder of this organization here. I got care I could not have expected anywhere else except in this hospital and maybe a few others. The facilities, the people were, were top notch. Everything was, was as they gave me a second lease on life. There's just no question. So, uh, I have to say thank you to them. I say thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I hope this uh, turns out that what goes on here tonight is beneficial to you. If I can be a tiny part of that, I, I would, I'm glad for the opportunity. So, Judy, back to you. Well, thank you, Keith, and uh, what an incredible story. And uh, thanks for sharing that. And we, we, we want to hear from Dr. Calvin, though, to explain in more detail how the heart functioned in Keith's case um, and when an intervention such as stenting, as he mentioned, may be needed. 
So Keith reflects on the fact that the, the heart is like an onion, that there's so many different facets to it. And he mentions some of those. So there's the arteries that feed the heart that in his case had a blockage, an 80% blockage. And some of that blockage is probably pretty fresh because there's a scab or a blood clot on it. We took him to the cath lab and the animation that you're show, seeing now is, is what we do where we can inflate a balloon to literally squish that plaque out of the way and then often we leave a stent behind afterwards to keep that area open. And so that's probably the most common intervention that we perform here and it's the most common intervention uh, in the United States. So we call that a percutaneous corner intervention. Percutaneous because we're going through the skin. We're, we're poking either through the wrist or through the groin. And whether you consider that a surgery or a procedure doesn't much matter, but it's, it's a procedure. Um, we sometimes have to do surgery because we can't open up a plaque or a blockage and we have to bypass it or we use some other material to get blood around it. And this is really interesting and cool because it treats that segment acutely. But as Keith says, the heart's this onion and there's all these other things going on in the same process that created that plaque and that one little segment. That one little segment that may only be 10 or 20 millimeters long. Uh, that's going on in, in, in all the rest of the heart arteries. And so what we do afterwards in cardiac rehab and, and elsewhere is really designed to prevent that, that blockage from accumulating in other places and to keep that blockage from breaking open. So that's, that's what we do. And in Keith's case, the, the blockage was enough that it, that it uh, set off a heart rhythm abnormality where the electrical system couldn't work properly and the heart uh, essentially stopped working. And so he was clinically dead. That's scary. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of it that way. I thought of unconscious, and that's as far as I was going. <laughs> nope, you were dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a white light, Keith. It wasn't a black one. Yes, it was. <laughs> And uh, let's move on to uh, cardiac rehab on, on that side of it. And Gloria, can you discuss the importance of rehab for patients? Uh, sure. Just as Keith said, um, it is an exercise program. Um, I guess if you want to call it a, a health club, that's kind of a fun way to put it. I'll have to use that with patients. But um, as time goes, as we get older, we start to get a little slower in our, our activities, uh, such as uh, for example, I like to use mowing the lawn. Most of us do that. Um, and over the years, you can do your lawn for, it takes you half an hour to do, you know, a section of your lawn. And as time goes, as you get a little older, it takes you a little bit longer, 35 minutes, 40 or so. So your body tends to acclimate to your, um, as you get older, to things. Um, in heart disease, that's kind of how it can subtly happen. Um, you start developing maybe blockages or your valve starts to, you know, not function as well as you, uh, as it should. So you're not getting the blood supplies you need to your body. So you start to get a little slower. Um, and so you become deconditioned necessarily. So your doctor sees you and they refer you to specialists and you get it treated. You get your stents placed. You may have bypass surgery. You may get your valve fixed. So now what you need to do is you need to get back to what your conditioning status should be um, since over time you probably have suddenly been getting um, weaker and more tired and fatigued. So the exercise program of cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab, there's three stages. The first stage is usually stage one or you know, phase one and that's in the hospital. That's after your surgery or your procedure, after you've had your stints, you stay overnight, the nurses get you up, they get you walking. And so that's what we consider phase one. Phase two is a three-month program, 36 sessions, uh, 12 weeks. Uh, actually, the sessions don't expire. You have a year to complete it. So if you, know, you have surgery in the winter and you want to go to Mexico for a week, two months out of your surgery, you don't lose those sessions if you're gone for a week. They roll over. Um, in this program, you get placed on a monitor, just as you see the gentleman up here on the picture. You get put on a telemetry. The nurses watch your rhythm. They can also uh, check your blood pressure during stages of your exercise. And then you, um, they, you know, sometimes if you're diabetic, they'll check your blood sugar. And a lot of times, it's a lot of education. They teach you how to monitor things when you're exercising at home. Because again, it's three months, so this is a phase two. It's getting you prepared to go out into the real world. And then there's phase three, and that's the rest of your life. Um, what you learn in phase two is what you'll, you should develop and continue to do as you uh, graduate into the program. Some programs allow you to come into the 
health club as we call it now, um, and do the phase three there. Or you can go to a local gym. Sometimes your insurance, you may want to check with them. Well, it's, I think if you are 65 or older, they have like a silver sneaker or something like that. Um, where they will actually uh, give you a discount or pay for you to go to a gym so that you can um, exercise, basically. So I think it's a great program. I used to do that before I became a physician assistant, and I highly recommend it. It's not mandatory, but I have known on here from other patients they really like it because it's so, a lot of socialization. Um, people there have probably had similar situations to yours, so they can you sometimes become friends with others that have maybe gone through it. I never have, so I can tell you from what I heard, but I've never been through it. So sometimes you just need that, that social um, you know, friend that you can make there. So it's a great program and it's highly recommended after you have this. Okay, and Sean, can you uh, share some examples of the advances in heart surgery? Sure, so I think uh, some of the biggest things that we've had lately are the minimally invasive techniques. It wasn't all that long ago that uh, people were having a sternotomy, so dividing the breastbone for all types of heart surgery. Now we have minimally invasive valve replacements through a small right chest incision about that long. Um, we can also do minimally invasive bypass in certain uh, cases. And then probably the biggest advance in the last, you know, five to ten years has been uh, TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement where we can replace a valve similar to how we just placed that stent in that last animation. And uh, those are things that are certainly revolutionizing heart surgery and uh, the way we think of treating patients. Sure, and Sean, can you, you know, share about the, you know, the assessment leading up to having the minimally invasive <coughs> surgery um, like TAVR? Sure, so typically people uh, come to you know, their primary care physician and maybe they've got a murmur and, and they get an echocardiogram and maybe they're referred to cardiology. Um, and ultimately, once they've, you know, been, their valve has been deemed, um, you know, operable, then they'll send them to our service, so the surgery service. So you'll meet with the surgeon, and then typically they decide, you know, whether or not you're, you're considered high risk uh, for an open procedure, whether that's even a minimally invasive or the sternotomy. And if you're considered high risk, then we, you put you into what's called the TAVR clinic, and you get a frailty assessment, you get more um, testing, including pulmonary function tests, you get... Uh, the big, probably the most important one is your uh, CT scan uh, of your, virtually your entire body to kind of plan out uh, and map the procedure, decide exactly what valve type would work for you, what, what way we're going to put it in, whether it's through the groin, through an, an artery in your arm, whether it's uh, through a small poke in your chest. Um, so you go through all those and, uh, and ultimately, depending upon what those tests show, kind of decide what route we're able to go. And here we have a, you know, very... Um, very good interdisciplinary uh, conference. So we meet with the cardiac surgery uh, team, meets with the cardiology team. We usually do that at least once a month to discuss patients. And we have a valve coordinator who will present uh, that patient. And uh, everybody kind of weighs in and thinks about what option is best for that patient. And so you get you know, both sides uh, of that. So that's, that's something that's, uh, that's very beneficial for the patient. Okay, and we also have a couple of um, animations showing TAVR surgery. Can you walk us through this slide and explain why this procedure would be offered to patients? Sure. So this is one of the, uh, this, like I said, TAVR, transcatheter aortic valve replacement. This is typically for somebody who's uh, not a candidate right now for uh, an open procedure, although they are, you know, looking to extend this to uh, the younger population. But basically what you do, <clears throat> a valve that's narrowed in the aortic position here, you bring up this catheter, and the same as we did with that stent, you kind of push that uh, valve aside, um, and it, the new valve actually fits within a stent. So it's got a stent on it, and you can see the valve there opening and closing. And this is all delivered over a wire through a small little needle poke in your groin. The technology for this is amazing. I mean, the catheters that go in are no bigger than your, your index finger. Um, and so this can all be done through a small poke in the groin. I mean, we did somebody the other day who was... I mean, over 90 years old, and a couple hours after the procedure, she said she wanted to go home. Huh. And uh, so, I mean, it's just an amazing technology. Okay. Well, this must be the other slide that I didn't click on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is a different case. This is, you know, um, they're showing <clears throat> just the valve itself and how the valves function here. And you can see how you want to have 
blood going in and blood going out. And if one of those valves is leaking or narrow, that makes a big difference in, you know, what type of treatment you need. And here's the, uh, the valve coming up again. This is another approach um, here. This is a transapical approach, so you can do it through the heart if your peripheral vessels don't allow us to get in through your groin. That's why that CT scan is so important. We can still do that procedure. We just have to make a few modifications. Okay. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, and so that thing is, that's held in completely with, with radial force. There's no suturing, nothing. Not like, uh, you know, the typical surgical valves where we, you know, implant those with sutures. Well, now we are going to take some questions from the audience. So keep in mind, uh, responses are not a substitute for medical uh, advice. Please <laughs> consult with your personal health care <laughs> provider for individualized yeah. care. But we can take some questions now. So uh, all right. Um, do we need to down here? A term I don't know anything about, but aortic heart valve deficiency, sh should your blood pressure be a little higher to force the blood through your system? No. Should, <laughs> it should be down in the 120s and... Yeah, so even in folks who have either a heart valve that doesn't open properly or doesn't uh, close properly, we generally think that blood pressure should still be controlled through our reasonable standard typical approaches in the vast majority of patients, there are rare exceptions, uh, in order to prevent all the deleterious effects of high blood pressure. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay. Um, I'm just wondering if you have a defibrillator and you're by yourself and you go into cardiac arrest, and the defibrillator will shock the heart, but if you have problems, will it continue to shock the heart, or how does that work? It depends on how the manufacturer sets up the defibrillator. But generally, it's not going to work if you're the only person there. So call 911. Any other questions? Plaque is the same as calcium whenever you have like a calcium deposits or are they different? And I guess the other question is we talk about you have issues with the heart with blood flow. What is a test that someone can do that says their heart is pumping 100%? Is that some simple test that you can get or not? So that's a fascinating question, one that we've been struggling with scientifically for the last 60 years. And if you could answer that last question, uh, there'd be a Nobel Prize involved with it. I'll get back to that in a moment, though. Uh, to answer your question, what is a plaque? A plaque is a buildup of cholesterol along with the body's uh, attempt to try to fight that with immune cells. And as a consequence of that, you often get calcium deposits, so calcium goes along with it. Most plaques end up having some calcium with it. And then sometimes those plaques break open. And if it doesn't severely injure the person, get treated, it's possible the body can heal it over. So we've come to realize that these plaques can be very dynamic things. They can uh, be in a process of breaking and healing and breaking and healing. And so our patients who have that phenomena going on, uh, we want to get them to medical attention promptly so that we can treat them to, to prevent a complete occlusion. To try to answer your question a little more fully about whether there's a simple test that you can do to make sure that your heart is healthy, um, the answer is no. There's no one test that can do that. So the heart is composed of many different pieces, and they all have to work together successfully for your heart to work. If you have a bad valve, the rest doesn't much matter. If you've got bad electrical system, the rest doesn't matter. If your heart arteries don't work, that's, that's really severe. Uh, over the decades, we've tried to come up with different tests that we could potentially do to, f to identify those at the highest risk of having heart attacks in particular. And so far, our ability to do so is quite limited. That's why primary physicians are absolutely critical to this day to do all the usual stuff about managing blood pressure and cholesterol and diabetes. 
And that's uh, also why it's so critically important that people remain active because every day that somebody goes out and they do something physically challenging, whether that's shoveling snow or walking on a treadmill or walking their dog or kayaking or playing handball or chasing the grandkids, the list is endless. But every time somebody does that and they feel pretty good doing so, they've just passed their own stress test. And so I beg my patients to have something that they enjoy doing that they can do almost every day. And if they notice one of those days that things aren't going very well, you need to let somebody know. See, the snow is good for something. Uh, over there. In regards to that catheter, the catheter uh, method uh, for a valve replacement, can that be a tissue or uh, artificial valve? So those were all tissue valves. Yeah, the mechanical valves that you're probably speaking of, those are metallic discs. Those you can't implant with the catheter-based. So it is all. So these are tissue valves. It's all tissue. Okay. Thank yep. You. Oops, this one. There. <laughs> uh, if you have calcium deposits in the rest of your body, does that is that a problem with in the heart as well, or is it are they all different areas? I'm thinking like of Achilles tendonitis that's caused by calcium deposits or in your arms or shoulders? So the process of having calcium deposited things in, in things like shoulders and tendons is a different process. It's not atherosclerosis usually, uh, so it has no direct bearing on the calcification of the heart arteries. That being said, if somebody has artery blockages in their legs or their neck or some of the other blood vessels, uh, then we on the medical side presume that the same process is going on in their entire body, which is why our therapies are designed to treat the entire body. Our medicines will help prevent plaque progression, whether it's plaque in the neck arteries that could cause a stroke, or in the heart arteries that could cause a heart attack, or the leg arteries that cause leg pain while walking. So the kinds of calcium you're talking about in particular is not, but artery blockages and other areas are, are of concern. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, and I have five stents. Now, do stents have a, a, some kind of a lifespan? Uh, uh, do they begin, become places where other plaque can build up? Are they smooth? It, it's, so most modern stents, uh, if they're taken care of, we generally think are going to last a lifetime of the, of the individual. Um, but that involves taking the right medications, watching your diet, exercise, treating high blood pressure and cholesterol, and all these, all these other things. There are rare individuals where the stent eventually becomes blocked off by additional plaque. That, that can happen. Um, but the biggest problem is that the stent treats an area that's only 10 to 20 millimeters long, and you have hundreds of millimeters of heart arteries and we can't stent every single little bit of heart artery. So again, that's why it's so important that we do things that treat the entirety of the heart, not just that one little segment. Any other questions? So how do you know if you have plaque? Is there a simple test or is it just by your symptoms, you know, breathing? And then if you do have plaque, if you change your diet, is it reversible? So unfortunately, plaques, uh, we typically think can become, uh, they can block off up to 50% of the area of the blood vessel before they show any signs or symptoms. So that's why cardiology is the premier field of medicine for prevention because the disease that we deal with affects so many people. It's so damaging to individuals, so fatal, and yet the amount of time we have to intervene and change the course is decades and decades and decades, if we're lucky. Now, unfortunately, half of people in this country only learn that they have a plaque or a blockage when they have their heart attack. And if we could detect that earlier, maybe we could do a better job of intervening in those people. 
But again, we don't have one simple test that's great for everybody. We played around with the idea decades ago of trying to do angiograms in a lot of different people to see if we'd find these plaques. And what we learned is that we're not very good at detecting them and an invasive test has so many uh, other risks that it's probably not a good idea to do in somebody who, who's without symptoms. Um, there's CT scans that can sometimes be helpful. I order those on occasion. Um, but the best single test for an individual is getting regular exercise. And if somebody can exercise at a high level without any sort of heart symptoms, then that's a pretty good sign that their heart's in, in, in good shape. All right. Any other questions? Those uh, valves that you mentioned, uh, what kind of tissue is that and what company provides those? <clears throat> it's kind of like cars. We have a whole host of them. We have Ford, Chevy, Dodge. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, there's numerous companies, but they're typically uh, pericardial tissue. They're either uh, pig or cow tissue, and a lot of times they're made from the lining of the, the sac around the, the heart of those. Sometimes they'll actually take uh, uh, the actual valve from the pig and put it on a stent uh, type material so that we can sew it into place. I guess my question is, it, it seemed like you had said if you're feeling okay and robust that everything should be okay, that's sort of a stress test. But in my case, uh, if we go back a number of years, I, I'm a runner, and uh, in my older age, um, my spouse thought maybe I shouldn't be running because you're getting old, but yet I was feeling okay. I mean, I was running you know, half marathons, but I decided, okay, I, I need to persuade her, so I asked to do a stress test, and were they... You know, you get on the treadmill, and I can't remember the other things where they do the scans, but it came up that they detected some calcium deposits. That's where I had asked that question about calcium earlier, and so it was decided that would be put on statins. And so I'm wondering, for a normal person, if you don't do something like that, yet you still feel okay, aren't you sort of like uh, maybe a time bomb of the calcium building up, or would you eventually notice it, or would you recommend a, a stress test for someone over a certain age, regardless if they're feeling healthy or not, to see? And the other question is, would you have to take statins forever? So to answer the first question, uh, from the available studies that we've done to see if doing stress testing in people without symptoms seems like a good idea, the consensus is no. It generates additional cost. It generates additional procedures, including things like angiograms, which are invasive procedures, which in and of themselves can potentially cause heart attacks and strokes. So generally speaking, we advise healthy individuals who are without symptoms not to undergo stress testing unless, again, there's some specific symptom or reason. I can't speak to your particular situation, but. But if, if an older adult saw me and said, hey, doc, I feel really good. How about we do a stress test to see how things are going? I'd say, well, maybe. But even if we did the stress test and it was abnormal, chances are you're still just fine. And I'm a medical director of stress testing. I love stress testing. So it has a lot of limitations to it. Uh, to get to your next question, if you have uh, blockages, do you need to take cholesterol medications for life? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Well, you don't have to do anything. But the process, is a, the, the process of atherosclerosis is systemic. It affects every blood vessel in the body. It doesn't go away on its own. And so I generally recommend that my patients uh, take cholesterol medications. And statins is really our first line go-to approach uh, for the rest of their life. Um, they have generally been tested and shown to provide benefit when used for a period of years. So when we're putting somebody on a cholesterol medication, we're really making a decision that could affect them for the next 10 to 50 years. All right. One more question. I'm a bypass, heart bypass patient, survivor. And I'm proud to say that it was completed in this institution. My question is, I have a hard time trying to understand that in a bypass surgery, you harvest a or extract a vein from
from another part of the body. In this case, it was my right leg. My question is, is, is there going to be a time in which that's going to be an artificial man-made instead of using a vein? I'm always concerned that, and I get, have a hard time getting my head around this, that you can take a vein and remove it from one part of the body. And I was told, you know, you can, the body can adjust to this and you can live with it. So is, is there something in, in the works that you're going to have, if you're going to have artificial valves and you're going to have stents and other man-made items, what about bypass? Thankfully, we were built with extra parts, and uh, the vein happens to be one of them. So I liken it to going from a, you know, like a 10-man work crew down to a 9-man work crew. The rest of your veins have to kind of pick up the slack. And thankfully, veins don't, they don't bring blood to your foot, so it doesn't make your foot cold by taking it. Um, you'll have <clears throat> a little bit of swelling in that leg temporarily, um, and then the rest of the veins kind of dilate and take over for that. To answer your second question, they have tried artificial uh, materials and the, the patency uh, for those just doesn't hold up the same as your own vein or your own artery uh, for that matter. I think they're still probably working on the background on all that. We do use it in other areas. We use artificial stuff all the time. So, uh, you know, for Wayne, we use an artificial uh, graft on his aorta, but that's in a lot bigger diameter vessel. That's a vessel that's, you know, three to four centimeters versus something that's one to two millimeters. And so the flow dynamics through something that's that small, you know, are, that, that's the difficult part, I think. And, and that may be what really holds things up is because they really struggle to prevent clots and blockages and things like that from forming on that because uh, it's artificial and your body doesn't like that. And uh, so we, we use it in other areas when we bypass the leg. You know, we'll use, we'll use uh, artificial material that's six or seven millimeters. Um, and those, too, are inferior to using your own vein. And so they've just not, especially with the heart, they've just not come up with anything, you know, small enough and, and that'll stay open reliably long enough yet. All right. Well, thank you all for your questions. And we want to uh, move on to something called mindful thankfulness. And it's one way to boost your spirits, feel happier, and enhance your overall health. Today we're challenging each of you to take deliberate time to be mindful each day and write your thoughts in the journal that we are sharing with you. It's our hope that you enjoy your gratitude journey and that it helps to build resilience in your life. Kind of us building on what uh, Keith was talking about and the, the positive attitude that we should all take. Also, let's take a moment to um, watch a short video about discovering gratitude. What if three small actions repeated over the course of one month could have a lasting positive impact on your mental health? Would you be interested in learning more? Here at Mayo Clinic Health System, we have a free virtual program we're excited to tell you about called Discover Gratitude. This is a way to practice mindful thankfulness, a practice that's been scientifically shown to boost spirit, increase happiness, and enhance overall health. The program includes a printable journal, which you can access at the website you see on the screen. Your journal serves as a reminder to do just three things every day for four weeks. First, acknowledge something you are thankful for. Next, perform an intentional act of kindness for someone. And finally, be deliberately mindful of the present moment. No matter your age, whether young or old, we can all benefit from these three small actions. Journal entries can be about big or small daily experiences, observations, or interactions. Kind acts can be simple actions to spread kindness, like visiting a friend who is lonely, sending a note to a friend you haven't seen in a while, or holding the door open for someone. Being mindful means enjoying right now, letting go of everything going on around you and in your mind. Research shows sharing kindness and being mindful can help create a positive outlook on life and improve our mental well-being. Each week, participants will receive an email providing information, tips, and encouragement. You'll be asked to journal your thoughts and actions for one month. Journals are private and will not be collected or viewed by anyone from Mayo Clinic Health System. 
We hope by participating in this program, you will notice your outlook change and have an increased feeling of resilience. That's it. You're welcome to participate on your own or use your role as a parent, grandparent, teacher, or friend to get others involved. We want everyone to realize the health benefits of gratitude. We're grateful you took the time to watch this video and hope you enjoy discovering your own personal gratitude journey. Let's get started. Go to mayoclinichealthsystem.org slash gratitude to register and learn more. Thank you. And remember, we've given ourselves the gift of time tonight, and we hope you make each day, uh, make time each day, incorporating these seven tips into your routine. Don't use tobacco, use alcohol in moderation, exercise 30 minutes most days, eat heart a heart-healthy diet, which is low in cholesterol, fat, and salt, maintain a healthy weight, get regular health screenings, that means blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, and discover gratitude and we need to take these tips to heart. So this concludes our evening, but before we go, we have some names to draw for our prizes, and here come the prizes. Okay. We have three? We have multiple. Oh, we have multi multiple, okay. So here we go. Uh, we have a cooking bag. That goes to Jean Schaefer, or Schaffer? Yeah, Jean's over there. Um, a book goes to Rita Gundry and Daniel Steiner. And then we have some bags to give out. Uh, Betty Butler. Uh, Betty, uh, let's see. And Betty's over here. <laughs> and then Janet Quarterer. Janet and Len, oh boy, Len <laughs> uh, Rogazuski, there we go, up there, and John Halberg. All right. And um, we all want you also to pick up a Discover Gratitude journal if you haven't already for yourself when you arrived. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for sharing your stories. And thank you for getting this information. We really appreciate it. Thanks again. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. There we go. <laughs>